afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. My name is Steve Sang. I am the director of the SOAST China Institute, and I am your host for today. Um, before we start, I'm going to be on this occasion very Japanese. Um, we don't usually in the UK start off any event with any kind of apologies, but I am going to do so. And I have slightly more apologies than I need to uh, offer you. One is to all the speakers that um, for all that I try, I may well be murdering your name. And if I mispronounce your name, please do forgive me. Uh, it is just that I need a bit more education from your culture and your language than I have so far managed to receive, even though I do learn from my colleagues from SOAST. The second um, apologies I have to offer you is that we had a slight mix up in the um, arrangement with Professor Adam Habi. Um, he in fact joined the uh, conference a bit earlier, uh, thinking that the slot that he has is a bit earlier than uh, we have in the final program. So he regrettably has to speed over to another meeting in another part of London and therefore is not able to join us. But he has given me the main points that he would like to raise with you and I will present them as I understand what he intends to say to you. Now, let's get to the um, conference. I wanted to underline that this is a SOAS wide event, which just happens to be hosted and organized by the SOAS China Institute. But it really is one that involves all the regional studies centers and institutes in SOAS as a whole. And the focus of, the, of today's discussions is not so much on China or how China deals with the world or how China approaches the world, but how the rest of the world sees China's efforts to reach out to them, both via hard power and via soft power. I think it really doesn't require anyone to say that China really does matter a whole lot to the world. And I think one of the uh, great thing about today's conference is that we are not focusing so much on the so-called traditional great power politics, putting China and the United States at, uh, at, the, at the center of that relationship. We are looking at the relationship China has with the many different parts of the world which are actually just as important, but are not often given quite as much uh, space and attention and recognition uh, in that process. And they also happen to be regions, areas, or countries that SOAS study across its many regional institutes and centers. And this will be re reflected very much in the range of speakers we have today. My original intention was to be a very clear format that we have the morning session on hard power, on China's hard power, and or rather how the rest of the world res respond to Chinese hard power and the afternoon still with Chinese soft power. And also grouping uh, countries or regions by their continents. Regrettably, I can't do either of them. Uh, partly because of the time difference, I think we do need to allow for uh, colleagues who are uh, quite ahead, quite a lot ahead in time to be in the morning session rather than in the afternoon session because it gets just very, very late for people in East Asia, for example, to join us in the afternoon. It kind of perhaps also um, reflects the reality on the ground. When we try to distinguish the impact of Chinese hard power and soft power, where does one end and where does the other start? 
if we focus on Chinese soft power, when, when does hard power comes in? When we come focus entirely on hard power, does it not have a soft power elements to it? So perhaps the reality that we have to mix them up is not necessarily such a bad thing after all. For today's event, we are organizing them over two sessions, each of two hours, with polls in between presentations to ascertain how colleagues, both speakers and other participants in the audience in many different parts of the world feel about uh, China and the views that have been articulated. The polls are standardized. So in every one of the polls, we will be asking you the same two sets of questions. And then at the end of it, we will have all the uh, views articulated being uh, combined together to give us a general sense of how people feel about China's uh, place in the world and how China engages with the, with the world. For the format, we are using the Picha Kucha format, which essentially means it's 20 slides for 20 seconds each. I ascertained it this morning that in fact, most of our speakers, if not all of our speakers have not used this format before. And this is also the first time I am, I'm using this format for uh, the SOAS China Institute. So we are all kind of learning about it. What I would propose to do is that when a speaker is invited to speak, I will set my uh, stopwatch up at exactly six minutes, 40 seconds. And at the end of it, there will be a doorbell tone to it. And that's, I think, a reminder to the speaker to wind up. And if by seven minutes or so, we st that still has, or seven and a bit, um, that still hasn't happened, I might well just jump in and advise a speaker colleague to do so. Uh, we have allowed a little bit of time for slight overrun, but we really don't have a lot of time for that. So I would very much appreciate if colleagues will uh, uh, agree to do so. This is the point when I am meant to hand over to the director of SOAS, Professor Adam Habib, for his introductory remarks. Now, Adam wanted to highlight that China is important and its importance is for the whole world, that we all must therefore pay attention to China, or if we don't, we are just going to be affected by it. And the event also showcase the range of expertise that SOAS has and, what, and the SOAS global network has. And it shows how the different regional institutes and centers do work to get together. And in terms of how um, the different parts of the world perceive of China, whether we're looking at it from Africa, from the Middle East, or from the whole of Asia from the West to the East, there are many different views being presented. And there are many different understanding of the rise of China. It doesn't mean the same thing to everybody. There are countries, regions that will find the rise of China a more positive uh, factor. And some may find it as a positive factor, but nonetheless bringing in problems, others may be a bit rather uncomfortable with it. This being an event held at SOAS, Adam would like to underline that we like polarity. We like to encourage people to articulate their views, whatever those views are. That diversity of views being articulated today is something that we at SOAS are very proud of. And here we are, Adam is not, I don't think, referring only to the range of views that, are, that will be articulated by you, this, the speakers, 
who come from many different parts of the world, but even amongst the colleagues at SOAS, or indeed even amongst colleagues at SOAS who are engaged in the study of any single part of the regions that SOAS studies, be it China, Japan, Africa, or the Middle East, or South Asia, or anywhere. That's the expectation we have is that we, colleagues at SOAS, have our different views. We articulate them, we debate them. And through that process, we expect to push the boundaries of knowledge and the boundary of understanding and the spirit of how this kind of open academic discourse can improve our understanding with each other. And I think these are the main uh, points that Professor Happy would particularly like to articulate. And next, I will be moving forward to introduce, to introduce our first speaker. And in a sense, the first speaker is also slightly uh, unusual from the rest, because after the first presentation, we are all getting speakers to reflect on how they feel about the rise of China, whether in terms of soft or hard power affect them and how their country or the region perceive that rise of China. But to set the scene, I am delighted to have a very distinguished colleague, uh, Professor Jing Wang, who is now based in Beijing. He is a um, Chinese American and at the Beijing uh, Language and Culture University at the moment to give us the opening remarks outlining the Chinese perspective of it so that we have a view, a very well-informed and authoritative view of how the Chinese government approaches the rest of the world and set us off in a good framework for us to respond by articulating how we in different parts of the world sees China. With that, I will hand over to you, uh, Jing. And when you start speaking, I will then put my uh, timer on for six minutes, 40 seconds. Over to you, Professor Wang. Thank you. I guess I got something screwed up. I want to share a screen of my presentation, the PowerPoint, but I don't know I got this one. Did you see my, or I got something uh, going here? Okay, I will pause the timer. Um, Aki or Lisa, are you able to help with the uh, PowerPoint presentation? No, it doesn't matter because I can just talk. It's a very simple point I want to make it. We, we said all without it, I can, I can do it. Let me try again. Uh, I think I want to share this one. Now, did you see it? Oh yes, we are seeing your, your PPT. If you put yeah. it on slideshow, then I will resume the timer. Okay. My first point, uh, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this very timely, important event. And uh, since I'm asking by Steve uh, to present this from China's perspective, let me try to do it briefly. First, from China's perspective, I, I think that China's rise has to be peaceful because there are two fundamental differences between China and the previous rise in power, like United Kingdom, Germany, France, so, so, so on. The first uh, fundamental difference is China does not have, even to this day, does not have a global rich military capability. Um, and second is that China so far does not challenge the existing international system as the previous rising power uh, did. Instead, China has tried very hard to integrate it, uh, to integrate itself through reform and the opening up policies to integrate itself into existing international system. So because of that, China's peace has to be peaceful and has been peaceful indeed because this is the only way China can rise up uh, given these two conditions. Um, my second point is that, um, that because of that, uh, China's rise has two most fundamentally important consequences from China's perspective. Number one, China has been deeply interdependent with 
the outside world, especially the advanced economies like the United States, like UK. And second, China has become the number one trading power way before it has become number one economy or number one power. Uh, that's why it is in China's interests to have a peaceful and a prosperous world because if uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, unstable, chaotic, or, uh, or, 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 or economically, you know, a bad world is not in China's interests. Um, but China has a fundamental dilemma. Uh, it is a, a, a very difficult one. That is, as China getting bigger and bigger, now it's the number two in the world, uh, the China's political system is incompatible with the mainstream of the international system China's tried to become part of it, has been part of it. Uh, this is this incompatibility of China's political system and the political mainstream of the international system or international order has become an essential source of China's problem with the outside world, especially with the developed countries uh, like the United States. And uh, now the problem here is, is this China realized this, this dilemma. So China's solution and China offers a solution uh, to the United States and outside world, uh, that is, uh, let's have a peaceful coexistence. You do, you make your living your way and I make my living my way. Let's peacefully coexist. But this solution offered by China uh, cannot be or can hardly be accepted by the established world, especially the United States. Because like we said, the way of life matters. Different political systems reflect a totally different way of life. We all know that for a human being, uh, uh, a forever dilemma is that our unlimited desire and demand versus our always limited resources. So the political system is really the way we distribute this limited resources available to us. So that's why it matters. And as China becomes more and more confident or even assertive uh, from outside world's point of view, uh, it tends uh, the outside world sees China tends to become a revisionist power rather than status quo power. This is especially serious challenge to the United States because uh, this international order is a foundation where the US hegemon or US primacy is, is based on. Uh, that's why it has to, you know, uh, try to, if not contend, at least to outcompete China as President Bird, uh, Biden has said. And now here is my final point. We have the US-China uh, competition right now, but the most formidable challenges for both the United States and China and other major powers included, uh, this most formidable challenges that come from within, from their own country rather than from the other side. As a result, the US-China competition is just a facade beneath this is a race between the two countries or two powers to see who gets its own house in order first. The uncertainty of internal politics, both in China and in the United States, makes it very difficult, if not entirely impossible, for the two countries to make any meaningful compromise in this future that we can see a foreseeable future. So that my last point here is for everybody to consider that that's why it is very important, imperative imp uh, to manage the US-China competition. Uh, that is God's real. The good news is that both topmost leaders, per President Biden and President Xi uh, has seen this. They repeatedly emphasized that we need to manage this relationship so that uh, the competition will not get into uh, unintended conflict. But the problem is that neither leaders can afford to appear soft. Another leader has to be very strong, at least appears to be very strong for the consumption of home audience. Um, like uh, Robert Putnam said in this two level game, uh, if we don't have any compromise internally, we cannot have the so-called winning set uh, to make any meaningful com compromise. So, uh, my conclusion to this is that we're going to say this go on for a long while, a long while, largely because, essentially because both uh, China and United States has a very uncertain uh, political situation at home. Thank you. Thank you very much.
your mic is still. So, thank you. So I, I do apologize. I had my, my mic mute. I was simply saying that, uh, Professor Wang, you have set up an amazingly good record, not only in presenting a very complex subject in a very succinct way, and done it within the picture uh time frame of six minutes, 40 seconds, which is really a uh, wonderful ways to set us up for the rest of the um, day. The second speaker that I would like to introduce, uh, invite you to speak is Professor uh, Jia Ian Zhong from the National University of Singapore speaking on the subject of promised pressure and the perils of not wanting to choose size, Singapore amid China-US rivalry, which really picks up very well from Professor Wang's presentation. Over to you, Professor Zhong. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Zhang. Uh, let me share my screen real quick. Sure. Let's hope, let's hope this works. All right. Brilliant, thank you. All right, wonderful. Um, so um, thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Steve. Uh, I'm not gonna waste time going over the presentation because uh, time is limited. Essentially what I wanted to uh, speak with everyone about today um, is to sort of look at Singapore's position sort of between the two major powers as US-China rivalry heats up, right? Um, and I suppose some of Singapore's experiences or, and what it will face would parallel what um, other smaller and middle powers might have to grapple with going forward. So uh, I'm sure many people have heard ad nauseum, this sort of claim about Singapore not wanting to choose sides, just like ASEAN doesn't want to choose sides, etc. cetera. Um, although the sort of actual content of not choosing sides uh, might, might differ, but essentially what it uh, tries to do, right, is to uh, have a policy, right, uh, that hews its way between um, the United States and China to uh, basically benefit from cooperation with both sides and also to avoid any downsides of friction. Now, this for Singapore uh, is somewhat more complicated than it would seem uh, because uh, on the one hand, uh, it has deep and enduring um, cooperative relationships on security uh, with the United States. Um, it has a strategic partnership. Uh, it has, um, you know, uh, cooperation on a range of issues. And then at, on the other side, um, you know, it's developing its uh, political diplomatic uh, ties uh, with the PRC. It also has uh, deep economic ties with the PRC. So uh, this is, I guess, some of that pressure that comes in that creates complications for how Singapore might want to uh, find its way forward. Ideally, of course, it would want to have its uh, cake and eat it too. But this, as it turns out, is going to be increasingly difficult and more difficult than, I suppose, um, what Singapore leaders might let on. Um, why, why is this the case? Um, I think if you look, down, look at uh, you know, opinion in, in Singapore, there's been some opinion poll, polling recently. Elites, uh, so this would be the bigger uh, diagram. On the right-hand side, uh, um, this would be a survey of elites done by the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies, uh, generally are far more skeptical of the PRC and uh, far more um, reassured right by by the, the United States. However, uh, when you look at public polling, this is the uh, diagram on the left hand side. Uh, this is done by Pew. Uh, you find that the public uh, in general has much more favorable views um, of the um, uh, of, of the uh, PRC and less so of the United States, although this is somewhat colored uh, by the experience uh, under uh, uh, of the US under Donald Trump. But at any rate, you can see how opinion is split. This split, I suppose, is quite uh, representative of how the economic relationship uh, is, um, is working out, because I suppose for most people in Singapore, this is what they see the most. I mean, a lot of the talk, right, is on how uh, trade with the US, but this is uh, merchandise trade, mind you, uh, you know, is outstripping uh, Singapore's trade with the United States. So this is the sort of bilateral relationship. Um, however, um, if you sort of broaden out and look at uh, Singapore's other major trading relationships, you'll find that it's trade with its uh, neighbors. ASEAN, this is the yellow line. Uh, China is, uh, continues to be the orange line. 
uh, outstrips its bilateral trade with China, and it's got a, a, a number of other major uh, trading partners as well. So in, in this sense, China seems to be increasingly important, at least on merchandise trade. Um, but you know, there, there are other sort of uh, considerations, other relationships that Singapore at least needs to think about um, economically. Now, um, if we sort of go, go through, you, you find that even when you look at the sort of bilateral relationship, um, the trade, the trading uh, partnership with China, it's important, but you know, it is not as overwhelming as sometimes uh, painted, right? Um, and things get uh, even more uh, complex if you look at uh, services, trade and services. The, the scale is different, but Singapore essentially has far greater uh, trade and services with the Europe and the United States. So uh, on the chart on the, on the left hand side, you see uh, this is the export of Singapore services. Uh, the export to Europe far outstrips right uh, exports to the United States and China. Uh, if you look at the import of services, this is uh, the chart on the right hand side, um, import services from the US, the blue line uh, is far greater than uh, China, which is the orange line. So the, tr the trade story is quite complex, right? And if you then sort of look at, um, uh, you know, the uh, the how this breaks down, uh, essentially much more Singapore's GDP, uh, you know, it goes into the service sector. So while the uh, merchandise trade is important, um, that trade and services with all the other uh, countries may uh, actually outweigh that relationship uh, on, on trade and merchandise uh, with the PRC. Um, and of course, if we look at uh, employment too, right? Um, the service sector takes up a much bigger proportion of Singapore's employment, right? Uh, you know, more than three quarters actually. So, uh, so there's a lot of emphasis on that trading in goods with the PRC, but I think it needs to be tempered um, by some of the other uh, economic considerations that are in place. And I think uh, this becomes even more stark uh, when you think about um, uh, FDI. So uh, in terms of outbound FDI, Singapore um, invests a lot in Europe. This is the gray line, invest a lot in ASEAN, the yellow line, uh, more than uh, China, uh, the, the orange line, even though Singapore is the largest foreign investor uh, in the PRC. Um, if you look at inbound FDI though, uh, Europe is far, far more important uh, than, than China, uh, the US, um, even Japan, right, is, uh, um, has a greater weight uh, than, than, than China. So Singapore is sort of uh, buffeted by these sort of um, different kinds of forces, these sort of different kinds of incentives that play out, right, in terms of how employment works, it, um, in terms of how the economy uh, works. So this is the, the stock uh, in FDI, it's bilateral, we don't have Europe uh, completely, but it gives you a sense of what those uh, graphs had uh, shown you. Uh, and of the sort of um, kinds of, um, uh, FDI stock, right? Uh, finance and insurance is clearly much bigger in Singapore as you would expect, right? So I think um, when we look at the economic relationship, um, the discussion is very much dominated by trading goods, but it's far more uh, complex than we would imagine. Now, what does all, all this uh, tell us? Actually, Singapore can profit and has profited significantly uh, from its uh, ability to bridge Europe, um, uh, the United States, uh, China, and also ASEAN. However, um, fundamentally, this rests on an overlap between um, American uh, and Chinese interests, right? As long as there's a significant enough overlap, Singapore has a wide uh, berth in terms of how it intends to be flexible in its policy without really touching um, lines that the PRC may not like. Um, but as uh, US-China uh, competition, rivalry becomes more intense. That space, right, the policy space actually decreases and Singapore's flexibility uh, decreases uh, correspondingly. That also means that this sort of not choosing side, two in the middle will become increasingly costly um, because, you know, your, your options get, um, get more limited. It also becomes increasingly risky because uh, a wrong step could potentially um, get you punished um, by yeah, one side. Yeah, why not? Right. Okay, so uh, that we might see with um, uh, with, with the sort of a punishment uh, with the uh, detention of Singapore's armored vehicles. So I think when we talk about choices for Singapore, it's actually um, it's not really about uh, choosing between the U.S. and China. It's about developing options for itself uh, to enhance its autonomy in, o in order for it to be able to sort of develop a, a stable set of relationships, to have a stable um, environment around it, and to uh, have its autonomy. And that, I think, is the sort of key consideration that Singapore should bear in mind. And it's not so much uh, U.S. or China, although that's going to be very difficult as Singapore goes through its um, uh, own leadership transition and can't really make a decision right now, and also the sort of pressures 
from uh, diaspora nationalism that seems to be coming out from China. That further complicates Singapore's domestic scene and also its ability to uh, navigate this increasingly fraught space. All right, let me end there. I'd be happy to take your questions later. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Jung, for this amazing presentations. Um, the next speaker also comes from Singapore, from the other leading university in Singapore, the Nanyang Technological University, and he is Professor Ho. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wu. You have one slice time worth to spare, exactly 20 seconds, <laughs> for which I tip my hat off to you. Now, we have reached the point of three presentations and our first poll. Um, Lisa, if you could post the uh, two questions for polling, please. And we have, a, a, I think, uh, five minutes for the poll. So if you could uh, give your answers to them and give us a sense of the initial responses you have for the two questions. Uh, it will get easier because they, you'll be asked the same questions. Please try to respond on the basis of what you have heard from the presentation so far, um, rather than simply on how you feel about, about them. And at the moment we have 100% believing that the Chinese government itself is a force for good. Uh, And that is now changing. Oh, sorry, that's uh, We have at the moment 67% participation rate, and we still have a bit of time to run for the questions. So if you have not yet voted, uh, please do.
Yes, I think times to end the poll, please, uh, Lisa. Thank you. I think we have at the moment 77% participation. Uh, this is the very first preliminary uh, polling. We have 4% saying that is positive in terms of the use of Chinese hard power generally. 30% think that on balance it is positive. 19% on balance not so positive. And 13% uh, no is not that pos not positive. And 33% thinks that it's actually too complex. For the soft power side of it, we have 3% seeing it as uh, very positive, 21% uh, as positive, 21% uh, as on balance not so positive, 27% not positive, and 28% too complicated to be put into pigeonhole at this stage. So let's just at the moment register that and then we will come back to see where we are with uh, where we are. I just noticed that there are some people raising some questions. Now, the issue is that in the format we are using, we don't necessarily will have time to uh, deal with Q and H. We are mostly relying on the pollings to get a sense of how people respond. But if we do have any time left at the end of the morning session, then I would be happy to field one or two of those questions that are in the Q&A box. Let's now resume the presentation to our next speaker who comes from Thailand, and that is Professor uh, Masana uh, Wangshura, Wangshura, Wangshurabat. Sorry, I, I do apologize for uh, not getting the wrong name right, from Chulalongkong University, talking about the Thai Guosheng in the Milk Tea Alliance, or in other words, the province of Thailand in the Milk Tea Alliance. Province of Thailand is not her words, it is my translation of it. If this is not correct, she will no doubt correct that for me. When your slides are up, uh, Wasana, I will start the call. Over to Thank you very much. Uh, and yes, that's a uh, perfect translation. Here are my slides. I've done some practice runs. I will try to keep it within uh, six minutes, 40 seconds. Okay, here I go. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, two very interesting phenomena that are happening at once. The first one is this joke that the Thai government wants Thailand to become a province of China, uh, being that it's very pro-China. And the second one is uh, that Thailand is seemingly involved in this seemingly anti-Chinese movement known as the Milk Tea Alliance. So how, that, how does that work? This is a colonial map of Southeast Asia. You might have heard the myth that Thailand is the only country in Southeast Asia not to be colonized. Uh, during the colonial period? Well, I think it is a myth because from what I'll be talking about today, you see that Thailand is actually the only country in Southeast Asia seemingly to still be in the colonial period. Why do I say that? I say that because the ruling class of Thailand, mainly the monarchy and the military are very good at manipulating uh, external uh, superpowers in supporting its position, its dominating position in domestic politics. And it did so by forming a very strong alliance with the uh, British Empire all through the colonial period. Uh, there was an attempt to end this with the 1932 revolu revolution, which ended the uh, absolute monarchy regime, but this government kind of did not work out because they uh, entered the Second World War on the side of the Japanese, and when the Japanese were defeated, uh, that was the end of this regime as well. So after the Second World War, the sort of right-wing royalist faction returned to the forefront of politics uh, because they claimed to support the allied powers who were in, in fact, the former imperialist powers in, in Southeast Asia, the British, the French, uh, the, the Americans. And so they were able to return to power. And through the Cold War, the, uh, the, the royalist right-wing then switch from the British Empire to align themselves with 
uh, the U.S. throughout the Cold War, and Thailand became known as the U.S.'s largest aircraft carrier in the Vietnam War. Uh, and through the Cold War, all uh, demands for democratization was branded as communist uh, insurgents, including the student movements in, in the 1970s. This change, uh, when the US changed its mind and Nixon said that he was going to pull out of Vietnam and shook hands with Mao, and you have the right-wing uh, royalist prime minister, Kukrit Pramod, following suit and shaking hands with Mao in 1975, establishing formal diplomatic relations. Uh, and from then on, you see a very clear shift of the royalist ruling class towards the PRC uh, from the post-Cold War period onwards. Uh, the image here is uh, on the left is the first publication of Princess Suin Khan's uh, travel memoirs to China, which she has published 13. This one is the first one published in 1981. And after that, she traveled to China uh, very frequently. And the picture on, on the right is an image of her receiving the Friendship Medal from President Xi Jinping uh, in 2019. Now, after this shift from aligning itself with, with the US during the Cold War uh, to aligning itself with, uh, with China, it was time to end democratization in Thailand. And so we see two consecutive coups, one happening in 2006 and the other one in 2014. Uh, and the, the regime that is still ruling Thailand right now under General Prayut Chan Ocha is the one that took power after the 2014 coup. Uh, and then since then, we have uh, seen Th Thailand become more and more under the influence of uh, the, the People's Republic of China, at least that the government is. This is a painting of a graffiti artist known as Headed Stencil, which came out in 2020. Uh, very strong message here. Uh, we see increasing uh, PRC influence in the Greater Mekong subregion in the water, water management of the Mekong. And on the right here is a poster of the 2016 film uh, Operation Mekong, which is actually based on a true story of the Chinese uh, hijacking the investigation and the prosecution uh, of a crime which occurred in the Mekong River between China, it, between Thailand and Laos. So I really see this as a case of 21st century extraterritoriality on, on the side of uh, China. Uh, we also see a rift happening within the ASEAN countries with many of the mainland ASEAN countries, uh, Thailand included, uh, trying not to get involved in the South China Sea uh, disputes and, and appearing to lean closer towards China than towards its ASEAN uh, uh, neighbors. And 2016 is very interesting. The first secretary of the Ministry of, uh, of Finance of Thailand suggested that maybe Thailand should try to achieve economic development by becoming the Siamese flea. The Siamese flea is going to tag on regional superpowers like China and India and achieve uh, economic takeoff, right? So you can see this, this expectation to rely on, on China very clearly. And then in 2019, you have the anti-extradition -extrad law movement in Hong Kong, which kind of like took over almost the entire year. And this was a very uh, important inspiration for the youth movement, the student movement, uh, demanding for democracy in Thailand, which happened throughout 2020. 2020 was also the year uh, in the first year of the COVID-19 lockdown. Uh, and we see the Thai government insisting on uh, using Sinovac as the main vac vaccine in Thailand, despite uh, overwhelming public outcry for mRNA vaccines. Uh, and, and this also made people, the general public kind of view the Thai government as trying too hard to please the Chinese government. Uh, April 2020, you have this outbreak uh, of Twitter war when a Boys Love star made the comment that Hong Kong and Taiwan is uh, our countries. And you know this sparked a Twitter war be between Chinese and uh, anti netizens, which resulted in the rise of this movement known as the Milk Tea Alliance, uh, where pro democracy uh, activists in Thailand, Taiwan, and Hong Kong come together online and view uh, China as sort of a major obstacle for democratization in, in the region. And you start seeing Milk Tea Alliance 
flags, China, Hong Kong and Taiwan flags in uh, pro-democracy demonstrations in Thailand. And 2021, you have uh, the coup in Myanmar. And so uh, pro-democracy movements in Myanmar uh, come into full force as well. And it's, it, it's very clear that people in Thailand see the, uh, the government as leaning towards supporting Myanmar. Uh, and this is a, a graffiti that showed up in Bangkok uh, recently of General Bayut and Minong Lai. And so in 2021, 20, we end with uh, Myanmar being included in this idea of the Milk Tea Alliance. So this is generally how uh, we, we get to this point of, of explaining the, the weird situation with Thailand uh, being very pro-China on one side and at the same time being very against China on the other side. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Vasana, uh, Professor Bonshu Rawat. Um, amazing presentation there, very thought uh, provoking. Let me now move on to invite the next speaker, who is Professor Jun Yi Li from the University of Nottingham. And Jun Yi has lived in Taiwan and knows Taiwan like the back of her hand. And her subject is panda or dragon viewing the rise of China from Taiwan. When your slides are up, I will start the uh, clock. Thank you, Steve. You. Let me try to share. Um, is it sharing now? Not yet. Share. Yes, it is. It is. Good. Um, thank you, Steve. I um, practice, but I'm not very good at this, but I try. So uh, thank you very much. I would like to talk from the viewing of Chinese rice from Taiwan, either is panda or dragon. Um, so in 2008, China sent two pandas to Taipei Zoo. Their names are Tuan Tuan and Yuan Yuan. Um, the meaning of the Tuan Yuan in Chinese uh, translation, the meaning would be reunion. Uh, that would be very much seen as pretty much of the Chinese government's hope that Taiwan will be reunited to the mainland. And be aware that 2008, that was also uh, Ma ying government was elected the first time. So along with the panda diplomacy as China sent to Taiwan, um, and China and Taiwan started to negotiate with um, the Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement, ECFA, in 2010. But actually, the ECFA negotiation uh, rose a lot of the controversies and doubt whether that was a negotiation between China and Taiwan or just between the CCP and KMT. Um, the student movement in 2014, Sunflower Movement, actually was a very big backfire of the uh, young, China, uh, young Taiwanese students uh, express the discontent of the, they would call it secret negotiation between uh, the KMT government and the Chinese government without to gain the legislative yen's approval. So the Sunflower Movement was the first in, uh, actually very significant backfire from the Taiwanese society to against these ECFA negotiation. However, um, actually, along with the mass government, we also see a lot of because wanting to get more of the cross-trade understanding. So actually, a lot of the mainland tourists also came to Taiwan uh, after 2010, 2012. Actually, uh, mainland tourists brought a lot of the revenue to this little island, Taiwan. Um, many of the mainland tourists deem Taiwan as a treasure island, so very popular destina destination for the mainland tourists. Uh, would say that um, uh, apart from the money that the mainland tourists brought into Taiwan, actually the Taiwanese society uh, felt some of the mainland tourists' attitudes were not that friendly. Uh, I would only think of um, they would have money, but they do not really respect the Taiwanese society. So apart from the societies not really um, seeing the moving closer to China is a good thing from Taiwan. Ma and Xi met in Singapore 
in late 2015. By then, Ma, of course, was seeing the end of his presidency and the meeting with President Xi was trying to secure the KMT to again another um, presidential election, not of himself, but the KMT. He wished KMT to be in the government and more, Ma's wish is to secure the cross-trade stability. Unfortunately, Ma's wish actually was falling because uh, the president Tsai Ing-wen from the Democratic uh, Progressive Party won over in 2016 and uh, as a, more of the majority in the society. So you could see that Taiwanese society since, to, since Ma's government wanted to move closer to the Chinese, actually society felt the opposite and expressed in President Tsai's election. Um, so here comes, a, after the, the, a friendly panda um, diplomacy, after President Tsai was elected, more of the dragons, that's the fighter jet, came across the street. Uh, I wouldn't say that fighter jet didn't visit Taiwan before, but I would say they visit Taiwan more often and more regularly. Uh, after the DPP came into the government. So Dragon started to stretch in their wings often and actively. Taiwan is a diverse society. So although that I would say, well, look from the poll and also the uh, presidential election, President Tsai DPP was winning of the majority, but actually there's still a supporter for more of the pan a uh, Chinese uh, supporter that is uh, what's represented as a lamb um, presidential candidate, Han Guoyu. Mr. Han Guoyu was seen as a more of the pro-China candidate represented the KMT uh, to compete with President Tsai's uh, in a uh, presidential election 2020. And this was a picture taken in 2020 January to see the supporters for Mr. Han Guoyu. Well, although there were supporters for Mr. Han Guoyu, uh, but Han Guoyu also was represented and broadcasted lavishly uh, out of proportion by this TV channel, CTI TV. This TV channel and then to be seen as a red media represented of uh, CCP's uh, argument or perspective. And Taiwanese society really do not want the media channel to be um, manipulated or controlled, influenced by the China factor. So this was the uh, massive uh, protest from Taiwanese society to ask the red media out of Taiwan. So I present the diverse view, but then after the uh, President Tsai Ing-wen re-elected in 2020, the war between China and Taiwan continued, but not through the dragon or through the panda, but actually through pineapple. So this year, 2021 March, uh, China used economic statecraft in a sense to boycott Taiwanese fruit pineapple to import to China, actually, that was caused a lot of Taiwanese society's anxiety and anger, but also Taiwanese friends like American and Japan started to say that we will import Taiwan's pineapple. So don't worry, Taiwan, your pineapple will be consumed by us, not by the Chinese. Having said so, Taiwan also has a very powerful, if you like, I would use the word shielding weapon, that is a semiconductor, TSMC actually is a provider of the global semiconductor value chain and still is a leading. And this is important for China to think and for the world to think of Taiwan. Um, Taiwan also suffered from the COVID a lot and uh, <laughs> actually a part, uh, very different from um, uh, Thailand's uh, experience that like Taiwanese government would accept any vaccine, but not the Chinese. So Taiwan received all the donated vaccines from American, as you can see, from Japan, but not the Chinese vaccine. So lastly, overall, what I want to say is Taiwan just does not want to be confused with the People's Republic of China, and this is seen 
as a new version of Taiwan passport, which we still have the official country name, Repub Republic of China, if you see in the circle, but Taiwan has been a lot bigger. I've been really compressed with my uh, presentation and apologize there are a lot of loopholes, but if you would wish, we have the online magazine of Taiwan study program. So a lot to be said on these short blocks and welcome you to follow. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Junyi, Professor Lee for this wonderful presentation. And let's now move on to the next presentation before we have a second round of polling. And the next speaker comes from Tehran in Iran. And that is Professor uh, Mohsen um, Soriatinia. And he is coming from the Shahid Bahishid, Bahishid University. And the subject is Iran and the rise of China. Over to you, uh, Mohsen. Uh, you are muted at the moment, uh, Mohsen. And your uh, um, screen share sharing has just disappeared. Uh, sorry, just a moment. Don't worry, we won't start until you are actually all up and running. Is it shared now? Yes. Okay. Or if you could put on the uh, slideshow. It's on the yeah. slideshow. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me. My pleasure to talk to you and share with you my assessment on Iran and the rise of China or how uh, a regional and revisionist power and close partner of China see the rise of the new great power in world politics. Uh, I would like to say uh, my assessment in three aspects of the rise of China, Iran approach to rising political China, Iran and the rise of China as an economic power that is the core of the relationship between the two countries, and Iran attitude and cooperation with China in military affairs. The political aspect of the relationship between the two countries, Iran sees the rise of China as an strategic opportunity because it can redistribute power and ideology in international system in favor of revisionist country like Iran. And for this reason, Iran side uh, signed first comprehensive strategic partnership after Islamic revolution with China. And in this uh, agreement, China said that support Iran development plan. It means that a strategic partnership is a big program or big plan for the future of the relationship between the two countries. And the new uh, agreement between the two countries is Iran full membership in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization after 15 years. And it shows the changing Chinese attitude toward Iran and toward Iran uh, permanent membership in the organization. Beyond the political uh, aspect, uh, in my assessment, uh, the rise of China as an economic power is much more important and useful for Iran because 30% of Iranian foreign trade is with China. Iran is under uh, the United States sanction for last 10 years. And san sanction uh, have had dual effect on the relationship between the two sides. On the one hand, severely restricted trade ties. On the other hand, reinforced the Chinese position as top trade partner of uh, Iran in recent years, particularly after the Trump administration imposed sanctions. And China is the only country that continue to importing oil from Iran after the United States withdraw from the JCPO. And Iranian sees the Chinese uh, continue to import oil as a Chinese commitment to the nuclear deal and the Chinese commitment to the uh, strategic partnership. Another aspect of economic ties 
between the two countries is Belt and Road Initiative. Iran sees Belt and Road Initiative as a strategic opportunity to revive its historical position as a bridge between East and the West. And there are important commonality between Iranian and Chinese vision of uh, infrastructure connectivity. And the two main projects are Tehran Mashhad Railway uh, that uh, started by the Chinese companies in 2015 or 2016 after the nuclear deal. This corridor is part of the China, uh, Central Asia, West Asia corridor. And the second important project is Tehran Esfahan High Speed Railway that is under construction by the Chinese companies. Uh, sanction creates some difficulties uh, in, in implementing this two project, but it seems the two projects are, are ongoing. Beyond the infrastructure uh, connection, uh, World Bank studies shows that uh, Iran could be an important winner of implementation of Belt and Road Initiative because it can improve Iran export capabilities, particularly in Iran's neighborhood. Uh, and also it can improve Iran market access. Uh, and that would be crucial for Iran economy because of the economies under sanction and economic diplomacy is a top priority for the new government in Iran. Uh, in my assessment, economic cooperation is at the core of a strategic partnership agreement between Iran and China as the first agreement that signed between uh, Iran as a, and a foreign country after Islamic revolution. In this uh, document, the two countries agreed to work on more than 50 projects, but asymmetric economic ties between the two sides or growing asymmetry in economic ties trigger a heated debate within Iranian society on two dependency to China and the nature of uh, win-win cooperation between the two countries. China as a military power is on the sideline of debates and uh, the engagement of Iran with the country, mainly because of the Chinese cautious policy in the Middle East and balanced policy in the Middle East and also Iranian, uh, also sanctions that impose against Iran in the last 10 years. If you look at the chart, you see that Chinese arms sales to Iran dropped down since 2010, mainly because of UN sanction and the United States sanction. Seems to me that uh, the two countries, uh, the military cooperation is on the sideline of the two countries cooperation. Let me conclude that Iran as a revisionist power sees the rise of China as an strategic opportunity. I mean, Iranian elite believe that China is an strategic opportunity. And trade is at the core of the relationship between the two countries and would remain at the core of the relationship between the two countries. And the United States uh, uh, reimpose sanction on Iran on the one hand, and also uh, intensifying the United States and China rivalry, it seems to me, create more and more room for cooperation between Iran and China. Let me conclude that in the uh, for coming years or for coming decade, China would remain on the top of the Iranian strategic radar. Uh, and uh, it would remain on the core of Iranian uh, foreign policy priorities. Let me stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Musa, Mushan, for this really enlightening uh, presentation. I think the point you make about the economic power being at the center of the Iranian-China relationship is really important one that we need to take hold take account of. Um, let us now move on to our second poll. I'm aware that most of the three previous presentations were on really primarily on the hard power of China. But let's also see what you think about the uh, soft power side of it. But you, uh, you want to focus on the hard power, that's okay too. 
Can we have the post up, please? Thank you. We have at the moment 66% participation rate and we still got a bit of time. So if you have not yet have a chance to put your input, please do so. Right. At the moment, we are at 70% participation rate. And if it stays at 70% and not moving forward, then we will end the polling and then move on. It looks like that we are staying at 70% participation rate. So we're about 30% of participants prefer not to vote. Incidentally, the result is completely from the participants the uh, speakers are not able to vote. Let's stop the um, poll now and see where we are. We have, in terms of the hard power, 
3% seeing it as very positive, 31% positive, 15% uh, on balance not so positive, and 18% not positive, 33% too complex to say, which is kind of reflected with the soft power question about 3% very positive, 20% uh, positive on balance, 30% on balance, not so positive, 18% not positive, and 30% too complex to say. Um, we will be adding all the uh, polling results up at the end of the day's proceeding, so that we will, we will, we will, we will see that. Um, I also notice since we had the poll last time that some participants have posed questions and speakers had answered those questions in the Q&A box. It does look like a rather good way of proceeding that way. So if participants would like to address a specific speaker about his or her presentation, um, please do feel free to use the Q&A box so that your questions can be responded. And I would certainly like to encourage all the speakers to keep an eye on the Q&A box. And if there were questions that were directed directly to you, and if you could answer that in the Q&A box, that would be very helpful indeed. Thank you. Let's now move on to the next presentation. And I think for the next three presentations, we are focusing much more on China and Africa relationship, and obviously, when I say Africa, it is a very big and diverse um, continent that we need to recognize that in full. Um, the next speaker is Ansese Mere from Kenya, the, uh, from um, FSD, and she is a development economist speaking on the very important subject of the future of Africa, China, economic relationships, perceptions, and reality. Um, and Sase had alerted me that she would not actually be using slides, but she would nonetheless be following the general framework of the uh, uh, conference and keeps to six minutes, 40 seconds or so. And when you start speaking, then I will set the clock running. Over to you, Sase. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. And thank you, Sars, for inviting me. So the reason why I'm choosing this topic of looking at Africa-China cooperation, perception versus reality, is because there is a persistent one-dimensional narrative on Africa-China relations that does not center Africa's views. And this narrative is often rooted in a global North view uh, that is often seems to be a bit xenophobic and frankly, persistently um, has inaccurate assumptions about Africa's ability. So the, the result is that we have a real problem with deep misinformation on what's actually happening between Africa and China in the realm of economic cooperation. So that's what I'll be focusing. So the first perception that um, I see persistently is that Africa is a passive actor that is acted on by China. This narrative it says that China is near colonial, China is focused on resource extraction. China is pushing Africa into trade dependency and, and a debt trap. And the debt trap narrative is a fable that has been proven by African analysts, by Chinese analysts, even by analysts in the US and Europe. And so there's this real perception that Africa is being acted on. Um, but the reality is, of course, far more complex. It differs on a case by case basis because Africa obviously has more than 50 countries. And above all, Africa does have agency. And that agency is, can be both constructive and destructive. And despite the lack of power, African governments do often get what they want from China. Um, so the situation on the ground is quite different from sim um, simple exploitation. What makes this difficult is that African agency comes from different sources. It's from government, it's from private sectors, from civil society, there's public opinion. And because it comes from a myriad of sources, it's not necessarily coordinated, it's not in co-agreement. Um, and so it doesn't show up as a force that is united in terms of how it's interacting with China. And of course, African agency tends to be reticulated within the power structures on the continent. Uh, but you know, the pie imbalance between Africa and China is real, but frankly, this is not unique to China. 
Africa, you know, I think the South African Institute of International Affairs aptly, aptly describes Africa as a resilient but marginal player in the international system. This is the power imbalance issue is not new um, for Africa. So it's a real myth that Africa is passive. And, and the real problem from an African perspective that, that, that China is acting upon Africa is that it infantilizes African governments and it absolves particularly African governments from being held accountable for decisions that they make on behalf of their electorate. Um, so in my view, the future of China, Africa, Africa-China cooperation from the African side, I think will be informed by more attempts, particularly by African governments to coordinate their agency within themselves and between themselves. But I think what we're also going to be seeing is a more pronounced impact and entry of the agency of African civil society and African private sector. The second perception I'd like to deal with is that as other speakers have talked about is that Africa has to choose between um, the US and China and this great power rivalry. And I just want to preface this by saying that this narrative is inaccurate within itself because the US itself is not decoupling from China. I think despite all the, the political rhetoric, the official Chinese data shows that the bilateral trade between the two countries surged this year. Um, China's shares of exports to the US is, is, is rising. And in fact, you know, um, when Occident Economics um, actually interviewed US manufacturers, they found no evidence that uh, manufacturers are prepared to retreat from China um, and that it's just not going to happen. Um, that said, there are specific areas where decoupling pressure is very, very deep such as in the technology sphere. But again, it's not as though that's going to happen with all US tech companies. So the question that Africa asked is that, why are we being forced or being asked to choose when the US itself is not decoupling? Um, and I think you have to remember that from an African perspective, the last time the real Cold War happened, not too long ago, it was at a terrible cost to Africa. We became the location of proxy wars and it caused severe underdevelopment of the continent and it did not allow Africa to center our priorities. And so to be completely unfair, I think to expect Africa to choose once again. And frankly, also, it's not a pragmatic reality, as I've said before. From an African perspective, the capabilities that the United States brings are quite distinct to what China brings to the, conti to the continent. They're often complementary. Africa values both. We see both. So there's really no incentive from an African perspective to choose. And I think as was seen in the forum of, of China-Africa cooperation, they just ended, and this has been the tone throughout, Africa operates in a multilateral world. Africa welcomes all countries to engage with the continent. And in the future, what I think we'll be seeing is a deepening engagement between, between Africa and China, particularly in the private sector. And the impetus for multilateralism in Africa will only deepen as the interest from other parts of the world, particularly the global south, is, is really beginning to get very strong. You know, countries such as India, Brazil, Turkey, a lot of Arab states having a lot of interest in Africa. So from an African view, multilateralism, I think, is the way forward and, and not really about choice. And the third perception that I'll deal with is a very new perception that China is pulling away from Africa. So recent data from the China Africa Research Initiative at John Hopkins indicates that Chinese loans to Africa public sector and African government has been declining um, and that this trend will likely continue. And that the, the narrative there is that Africa sees China's to, I mean, China sees Africa as too risky, too costly. There are concerns about Africa's debt sustainability and that, you know, Africa now has too many civil conflicts, too many coups. The reality is that China is pulling back massively from lending in development finance globally in Asia, Latin America, not Africa. And it seems to be informed by a myriad of issues, structural policy shifts in China itself, interest in consolidating and absorbing investments made in the past, focusing its own resources more domestically. And also China seems to be interested in lending through multilateral bodies rather than bilaterally. Um, and so in, our, in my view, the pullback of lending from African government should not be conflated with a pullback of investment from the African private sector and the African um, economy in general. Frankly, I think it's tactical for China to pull back from a very uh, two-year, uh, a 20-decade, 20 uh, 20-year period of very deep capital-intensive infrastructure-led um, lending to, to the continent um, that's very clumpy and very difficult to get out of and very complex to manage. So it makes sense that there's a need for some of that to settle. And, and, and I think it's interesting that as China's pulling back from infrastructure, we're seeing B3W in the US and we see the Europeans now come in with these massive plans to spend in infrastructure. So I think what we're seeing, rather than a pullback from Africa, we're seeing a pivot of China's really trying to focus on private sector engagement in Africa. Do bear in mind that China is the fourth largest investor in Africa by FDI stock. 
it is above the USA. Um, and the China um, Africa Business Council actually says that by, by the end of last year, the stock of investment in Africa stood at about uh, 47 billion. And do bear in mind that the just concluded forum of China African Cooperation, there was an explicit statement that China will encourage its businesses to invest no less than 10 billion um, um, dollars in Africa in the next three years. So I think the future that we're going to see there is just there will be a pullback, I think, from the government, but there'll be a deepening um, engagement on private sector led engagement in Africa and China, particularly in the context of the African continental free trade area, with the real focus on agriculture, the digital economy, and the green economy. And I think I'll end there. Thank you very much. Fantastic, uh, and Sassi. It is exactly why it's so important that we have colleagues from Africa speaking at this forum. And the next speaker comes from Nigeria. Uh, that is Professor Toby Oshoti from the Lagos State University speaking on the important subject of oscillations, Nigeria, China relations. Over to you, Toby, and I won't start the clock until your slides are up and ready to roll. Thank you, Steve. I'm, I'm really happy to join this conversation, you know, and I think I, I, as it say, uh, actually, sorry if I'm not pronouncing the name well, actually simplifies my presentation. I'll be talking about oscillation of Nigeria-China relations. So the, the idea of oscillation is simply that rather than a, a kind of simplistic narrative of what China does in Africa, in this case, Nigeria, there's this, you know, complexities that involves the unpredictability, instability across level, across state-state relations, as well as across the people-to-people -people relations. Uh, the presentation will be in four parts, a brief introduction, you know, trying to talk about China-Africa relations, locating Nigeria in that context, then talking about the oscill oscillation and uh, my, my, my conclusion. The, the presentation actually, you know, the foundation for my presentation is based on two uh, previous work. One is journal article that talks about the oscillation of two giants. Then the so second is, you know, this idea of asking what happens when Pax Nigeriana meets Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese Africana. So, but of course, to understand Nigeria-China relations, you need to locate it within the broader context of China in Africa. Before it used to be Chazara, that used to be the landmark. But today, as we speak, the AU Secretariat, you know, is be, was built by China in Africa, was built by China. And the CDC complex is also built by China. So, but in discussing China, my approach is to, there are two approaches, the TIC, which looks at what China does within a particular country, within the continent. But the TIC dimension actually looks at China in Africa beyond the specific continent. And in the case of Nigeria, you know, if you, if you, if, if you are new to Nigeria, you fly into an airport that is being reconstructed by China. You travel on a railway road that is being, you know, constructed, bridges that is being constructed by China. At my university, for instance, China is building one of the biggest uh, libraries. You know, the Senate block was built in China. So Chinese presence is actually pervasive from hospitals to completely building university. The University for Technology in the president's uh, uh, in Dawa is being constructed by, by China. So of course, because of this infrastructural finance that China provides, there is the win-win smile. Virtually all presidents in, in Nigeria has you know, visited China. President Olu Shegun Basanjo, for instance, made the memorable you know, quote that when China is going to the moon, please don't forget Nigeria. But my, my talk is actually to draw attention to the instabilities in this Nigeria-China relations. And I'll be talking, touching on just five of these, you know, talking about the discursive, of course, talking, touching on the, 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 the COVID health diplomacy and the rest of it. As we speak today, you know, Nigeria had a civil war between 1967 and 1960, between this, the, the, the secessionist Biafra forces and the federal forces, you know, led by Ojuku, Emeka Ojuku. 
But officially, the elite position has been to actually silence that from their own narrative. President Olusegun Gombasanjo, for instance, referred to that as a rumor. But if you go and do a content analysis of the newspapers that were published within that period, you see even military officers talking about this Chinese uh, influence. Then again, coming to the, the, you know, the oscillation within the COVID, the Chinese COVID diplomacy. April last year was, you know, you know uh, probably not episodic, but epochal reality in Africa-China relations, where Africans were reportedly maltreated in Guangzhou. But in Nigeria, it was a major newspaper, you know, it was really in the news to the extent that a recent comparative analysis that I tried to do, trying to look at the Ghanaian newspaper that actually reported more of that episode and just opposing it with the Nigerian demonstrates that, you know, you had more Nigerian newspapers reporting it. But to the question of oscillation, at some point, the Nigerian government, the political elite, explained it as a failure of public communication, poor communication. But with pressure from non-state actors, as well as a few you know, lawmakers, the, the elites backtracked and they became more critical. Then another example of this oscillation that I talked about happened in, you know, under the, you know, under the president, under President Olusha Gombasanjo from the same political party. His predecessor, you know, President Obasanjo introduced this oil for an um, oil for infrastructure, but his predecessor changed it within months of getting into power. Then, of course, the another instance of that oscillation is in terms of how the, the Nigerian legis legislature engages with China. The APC is the ruling party in Nigeria, you know, the All People's Congress. But of course, the, the, the lawmakers are also one of the most critical of, of, of China in, in terms of whether there is going to be a debt burden or you know, debt trap and the rest of it. Let, let me quickly go to Taiwan. Niger, Nigeria recognizes the one China policy. But of course, in spite of that recognition, it also understands that it's trading with China. In fact, in the First Republic, at least four years, for four years, Ch Taiwan bought more oil, which is Nigeria's main stake from Nigeria than, than China. So even when 2017, Nigeria had the, you know, the one, you know, the, 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 the foreign affairs minister for China visited Nigeria. Nigeria was forced to push Taiwan out of Abuja, but not out of Nigeria. So my conclusion is mainly that in understanding Nigeria-China relations, we need to understand, locate it within that dynamism, not in terms of its static nature. And I've only talked about five of these uh, uh, episodes. There are several other episodes. Thank you, and I will hope to get questions uh, after this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Toby. That is uh, amazing. And you time it bang on the dot as well, which is also a significant achievement. Um, important subjects that we need to remember. And let's now move on uh, to our last speaker for the morning from the home team at SOAS, uh, from Professor Carlos Oya, speaking on China's contributions to efforts towards economic transformation or structural changes in sub-Saharan Africa. I can see that your slides are up, uh, Carlos. So over to you when you start, then I will switch the clock on. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Yes? Perfect. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me to this um, um, panel. It's absolutely fascinating and I've enjoyed every minute of it. And, and it's also a pleasure to follow the previous two speakers who uh, have basically presented a number of key ideas with which uh, I very much uh, agree. So it's, it's, it's good to see that there is quite substantial coherence and congruence between these different views. I'm just going to focus on one aspect of uh, the relationship between China and African countries. I mean, I, I try to avoid this general reference to Africa because there is so much variation in this respect. And, and one of the angles is the imperative of structural transformation of African economies, and particularly 
the uh, deficit of industrialization. So I'm going to start with this first contextual premise in order to understand China's contribution of the last 20 years or so uh, to some of the uh, efforts that have been going on in the continent uh, um, in relation to this issue. So there is a historical deficit of structural change through industrialization in much of the continent. And this is despite the post-colonial aspirations, which were uh, uh, um, manifested in the 1960s and 70s with uh, substantial efforts to kick off industrialization, but which very quickly moved uh, onto a period of neglect and liberalization driven deindustrialization. So what's happened pretty much since the 1980s in many economies of the continent is a growth without industrialization, at least a growth without structural train change led by industrialization. A sort of Morgenthau plan for Sub-Saharan Africa for those of you who know the Morgenthau plan for Germany. The second pre contextual premise is that there are various contributing factors to this uh, uh, situation. The stalled industrialization in the 1970s because of the crisis of that time, very weak economic infrastructure that has been inherited from the colonial period and into the post-colonial period, the lack of policy prioritization of industrialization, especially since the 1980s, and very importantly, in a continent that is still very dependent on foreign aid, the lack of external finance directed towards structural change and productive sectors. So these, these have been prominent contextual factors to the lack of industrialization. So this, this is where the China's engagement in Africa comes in. And we know there are multiple vectors, you know, the literature talks about trade, investment, finance, etc. And there is an increase in attention to the role of China, Chinese enterprises in many African countries. And I would uh, highlight especially two types of actors infrastructure contractors, which happen to be mostly state-owned enterprises, and private manufacturing companies, which have expanded their presence in several economies to a large extent. But there is a lot of variation across countries. Some countries have seen this much more than other African countries. So the current discourse of industrial emerged from some of the public pronouncements from the various FOCAC meetings, especially since 2018, is encapsulating this sort of effort, again, within this win-win umbrella, where more and more emphasis is put on the question of industrial cooperation and more specific commitments are made to further the uh, advance of this uh, narrative and this, this, this agenda. So what are the key channels of China's contribution to African industrialization efforts, again, where these efforts actually happen? Now, there are four main channels. One is the finance for infrastructure and the building of infrastructure that is critical for manufacturing investment, energy, roads, industrial parks. Secondly, foreign direct investment and particularly private industrial investors that have been invested in a number of countries. Again, not many countries, but an increasing number of countries. Third is the access to suitable and affordable technology, especially for low technology manufacturing sectors, such as the light industry, textile, apparel, garment, etc. And fourth, the availability of patient capital, patient finance for manufacturing investment, something that has been missing for at least three decades in the finance uh, context of most African economies. And this has happened more or less across the board, but in some countries much more than others. So that is then manifested in variation in Africa's industrialization efforts. In order to understand this process and this evolution over time, especially over the last two decades, we need to understand some elements of the China's economic context. And there's a few uh, snippets there. But basically, the, the movement towards a new normal in the Chinese economy and towards basically getting rid of low technology obsolete sectors is providing key opportunities through the globalization of Chinese firms, which is also encapsulated in public discourse, so that we are in a situation where we move from the time where Chinese imports were outcompeting in African manufacturers and badly affecting, for example, textiles, the case of Nigeria is, is prominent in that respect, to Chinese investment, mostly private investment, promoting these kinds of manufacturers. So it's an interesting type of evolution. Former World Bank economist Justin Lin has been talking about these 80 million manufacturing jobs potentially, and I underline the word potentially, going towards Africa, as long as uh, the efforts to industrialize are there. Some of this is manifested in the share of the of uh, Chinese investments by sector. So you can see the manufacturing sector assuming a prominent role in that share. 
uh, above other other sectors in terms of the number of enterprises operating across different African economies. And we do see also in the uh, creation of manufacturing jobs, for example, Ethiopia is a prominent example of this until 2018, 2019, where Chinese firms were leading that process of job creation in the manufacturing sector. And this is encapsulated in the, in the sort of multiplication of textile and garment fa uh, uh, factories in a number of countries and not just in Ethiopia. So let me conclude with a few thoughts. Does China, in relation to these big questions, does China contribute to industrialization efforts in Africa? The answer to that is yes, but there is still a lot of variation across countries. And this is because not all countries and not all African governments are actually strongly pursuing industrialization. So agency does matter as one of the previous speakers clearly uh, presented. So how? So this is basically the combination of vast expansion in economic infrastructure and the arrival of Chinese industrial firms investing into those sectors that are more likely to be competitive in some African economies. Are they contributing to job creation? Absolutely, yes. And to much more extent than is usually perceived, especially in the manufacturing sectors. And finally, is this enough? No, because this will only happen if there is sustained African policy prioritization and efforts that are needed over long periods of time. This is a long-term game. And as the Ethiopia example clearly suggests, anything can be dismantled in a matter of a few months. Thank you very much. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Carlos. That was again a fascinating presentation, which I think is highly, uh, puts a highly complex story through in a beautifully succinct way. Um, with three presentations on Africa, a subject that I think the China Institute is certainly very happy to be working with our African studies colleagues as so as to promote a lot more. Um, let's have our third poll, last poll in the morning, and then uh, we can have a bit of a wind up for the morning session. Can, yes, the poll is up and let's see where we are. Please start your responses.
we are at the moment settling at around 67% of participation. We have previously about 70% or so, but obviously the level of participation can vary. If it stays at 67% for, oh, it's moving. Thank you. Okay, it looks like that we are having 70% participation rate as we did in the last poll. Um, let's now stop the polling and then have a quick look at where we are. We have about 4% who sees China's use of power is very positive, 47% as on balance positive, 10% on balance not so positive, and 12% not positive. 27% um, too complex. It's largely mirror, I think, with the um, soft power question, which is also 6% very positive, 39% on balance positive, 22% on balance not so positive, and 6% negative, and 27% too complex to be put in individual categories. Now we have about uh, six or seven minutes before our time is up. So I'm not going to try to sum up what we have discussed this morning. I think that would have been quite unrealistic and impossible. What does strike me is how the polls varied when we have a session which focus entirely on Africa compared to the earlier sessions, which are very heavily are represented in terms of East Asia, China's near abroad. And clearly the perception there worried a bit. Not so much that we will say that they're completely different, but there is sufficient difference in terms of how that is being preserved. And I think it also shows how much the parallel between the hard power polling and the soft power ones actually match each other more than I think one would necessarily have expected before we have this exercise. I think people or colleagues probably needs to pay more attention to the actual availability of Chinese soft power. And we mustn't really just dismiss that uh, off hand. And I think also what is so interesting in this morning's presentation is the huge diversities of, of views being presented and how, as I designed this exercise to focus on China's relationship with um, the Asian, Middle East, Africa contacts, that the US-China relations come back again and again, to whether we're talking about East Asia or whether we're talking about um, Africa's relationship with China, the United States relationship with China, just cannot go away. It is affecting everybody and it is very much uh, noticed and taken into account by everybody there as well. Now, what I think also interesting is how much our colleagues, particularly uh, from Africa uh, and working on Africa, focus on the agency, which in fact also was being rep represented by our colleagues speaking about East Asia, uh, whether Singapore needs to, to choose, that's about Singapore's agencies, not how Africa deals with it, it's about Africa's agency. How Iran deals with it is a lot about what really matters to Iran. How Taiwan look at it, that was also about how the local uh, community um, look at the situation, but they have to do it within that wider context of what China is actually doing there. And also 
how not only China, but China and the United States together um, making us to feel that we have to make a choice between them. And most don't want to make that choice. I think what the case of Thailand was also very uh, illuminating was how that local agency also came out in terms of, uh, in, the, in, in Thailand's case, it seems to be a more strong uh, negative response to the extension of Chinese influence in Thailand. Another part, an important part of the near board. When Rasana was making that presentation, I keep wondering how, how we would look, how this um, session would have looked if we have included uh, colleagues who are based in other parts of Southeast Asia. I mean, particularly, uh, say, for example, Kampuchea, and how that would have presented a slightly different picture, and how Indonesia will look at that relationship, how Malaysia would have looked at that relationship, and how the changing relationship between the Philippines and China would have been reflected. So I think this has been an amazingly useful exercise that we have this morning. Um, surprise, surprise, for this morning session, we have filled a rather small number of contingents from the SOAS team. We will have more SOAS colleagues in the afternoon session. Um, it just happens to be the way how we were organizing it. There was no particular design to that. But like, what it does show is the wider SOAS network has brought in so much important views that if this had been a so SOAS China Institute operation rather than a SOAS operation run by the SCI for all the regional centers and institutes, we wouldn't have that diversity of views. And it's important that we work on that and uh, make the most of that. Well, with this, let me thank all of you, uh, the speakers as well as participants for a really stimulating morning session. Um, the afternoon session will start at 1.30, which is about uh, one hour and a minute from now. Uh, please remember that you will need to use the afternoon session link to join the meeting. Uh, you will not be able to join this meeting using the morning uh, link that you had used this morning. And the reason that we have to do so is for the uh, quality of the recording for others. So thank you very much. I hope to see most of you back in the afternoon. And I wish you, for those of us in the uh, lunchtime in Europe, wish you a lovely lunchtime. For others, enjoy the break. See you soon.